Larry, let's start with new comments from Russian officials. They're talking about non-strategic nuclear weapons and Navy getting prepared. Why Russians started talking about this? How do you find the current face of the conflict in Ukraine? Are they getting prepared for new escalations or they're trying to send a message to the West? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> you know, um, look, it start. I think it was a combination of things, a reaction to the statements of uh, Macron of France talking about and putting French troops into uh, Ukraine, as well as the Poles talking about doing it and hearing the Latvians uh, saying that they're going to send troops. Uh, the Brits, David Cameron, making the crazy comment encouraging the Ukrainians to use British missiles to strike inside Russian territory and kill Russians. So Russia, I guess it was Monday, they did a, they did a combination of things. Um, because they sense the growing desperation on the part of the West with respect to the situation in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are losing. They're losing badly and they're losing quickly. And uh, Russia wanted to put them all on notice. Called the French ambassador in, called the British ambassador in, basically told them, said, look, if you do this, then we're going to hit not only your positions, your resources here in Ukraine, We'll hit them outside of Ukraine, including in your country. So if you go that route, be on notice. We're we're not going to stop at Ukraine's border because you've attacked us first. Well, you know, the French probably did, uh, you know, a 180 degree turn, or as Anna, Anna, Anna Leah Baerbach calls it, the 360. But uh, they came out. And uh, within 30 minutes, the French foreign ministry issued a statement. Oh, no, we're doing... never, 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 never. No, 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 we're not, we're not sending any troops. No, we're not going to do that. Well, okay, so at least they got out public on that. Um, the Brits, uh, Cameron's people went to the Associated Press, I guess, which had reported his remarks because they were recorded. I mean, he was. it wasn't like he was doing this in secret. He, you know, he was uh, in Kiev, I think, when he said it. They took it down trying to pretend that he never said it. So, you know, you've got a you've got a situation in which on, on that front, and then they the, the, the Russians put the uh, whipped cream and cherry on top by saying, and oh, by the way, we're going to conduct tactical nuclear exercises because we will use them if necessary, if we're threatened. So now... They didn't clarify, and, and maybe there is a clarification out there, but uh, I don't know if they announced that they were going to actually start and carry on such an exercise, or if they are announcing that they were going to do one eventually. Any military exercise that's carried out like this requires usually a minimum of 12 months of planning. I suppose it could be done quicker than that, but just in my experience, these uh, these kinds of exercises usually they have an advanced planning process that takes place 12, 16, 18, 24 months beforehand. So I don't know if the Russians the other day were announcing that they're starting the planning process to do such an exercise, or if they had already had the planning process underway and announcing that they're getting ready to hold it. I, I don't know um, if it uh, if it's the latter that, you know, they've already had it underway and they're getting ready to hold it. Then they really are trying to ramp up the message to the West. You know, don't screw with us. You know, you stop enabling, stop facilitating the murder of Russian citizens. Or else we will use all all means at our disposal to protect ourselves. Larry, we've heard Akeem Jeffries talking with 60 Minutes, and he said that the United States is willing to put troops on the ground in Ukraine. At the same time, Biden just saying that, no, we, we're not going to do that. And yeah, he's a moron. Jeffries is a moron. He's an ignorant man. He has no experience in this. 
he th he thinks he's moving chess pieces around on a on a on a board, you know. But it's a board game. He can play. He can touch it. He doesn't have the first clue what he's saying, and the implications of it. Um, uh, if the United States were to do that, the United States, I believe, would face attacks by Russian missiles on U.S. territory. Russia is not going to screw around on this, and. The problem with the United States is the last bloody war that we fought, the last war where we really got our nose bloodied and suffered, was the American Civil War, 1861, 1865. We, you know, we suffered some casualties in World War I, but, you know, that wasn't uh, overwhelming. And we suffered some casualties in World War II. I mean, our Hollywood mythology about it portrays it as, oh, my God, this titanic world struggle. And I just I just ran the numbers last night. So the Russians, in terms of dead, killed in action, soldiers and civilians, out of every 100 citizens, 16 were killed. And when you add in that number of wounded to that, then that's, you're up around, who knows, 25, 35 out of 100. Huge numbers. That means almost everybody was affected. How about the United States? Line up 100 people. Take the one little guy at the end of the row and just cut him off below the knees. Just take 20% of his body. That's how much the United States lost. So... That's why yesterday, on Victory in Europe Day, nobody in the United States, frankly, gave a shit. They didn't care. Didn't remember. No commemoration. Oh, that war? Oh, who fought that, by the way? I mean, they've, got, they've done surveys asking college students, uh, you know, uh, when was D-Day? Uh, was that December 7th, 1941? Yeah, I think, you know. They can't figure out Pearl Harbor from D-Day. They don't know who Dwight David Eisenhower was. And what we don't realize in the West is the kind of price that Russia paid in World War II to defeat the Nazis. Because we've taken credit for defeating the Nazis. It was us. Those Russians were a bit player. Complete lies, just the opposite. We were the bit player. Um. And we always like to tell the story, oh, Shatalan was always begging us to start this offensive. Oh, if you don't do it, you know, that we're the saviors. It's such crap. And what it's done, though, is it's created this ability of the United States. But by God, man, we're going to go overseas and we're going to get into this war. And we're going to get into that war. We're going to do Vietnam. We're going to do Korea. We're going to do Iraq. We'll do, let's do Iraq twice. Let's do Afghanistan. Let's, let's kill them all. And what happens? We get richer out of it. We don't get that many people killed. Okay, 58,000 died in Vietnam. They were suckers. They got fooled. They got bamboozled. They actually believed the bullshit that was coming out of Washington, that they were fighting international communism to pre prevent the, the world from falling under communist uh, dominance. It was a lie. And they died for nothing. But they died in the in the belief that they were serving their country, so that the people who died were honorable people. They they were trying to serve to the best of their ability, and they sacrificed their lives. But it's it, it's just you know it's all a lie. And so here you now got a clown like Hakeem Jeffries talking about oh yeah we're going to have to send troops. I just say to him, make sure you're at the front of the line, buddy. Let's get you trained up and you get over there, you know, sitting sitting on your ass in your fancy office in Washington, D.C. is one thing. Getting off your ass and getting out there on the front line, we have to kill somebody or run the risk of getting killed or being maimed. Whole different ball game. So stop sending all of these white Southern kids who are conservative Christians that you're vilifying. Stop sending them overseas. In fact, a lot of them have stopped enlisting. You go yourself. You know, I, I I really get worked up about this because it is so out. We that we've done it over and over 
and over, and we're not stopping. And the reason we do it is we don't pay a price. You know, if if you had to do something where you ran the real, you know, a 60% risk that you're going to lose your right hand, you'd probably not do that thing because it would be considered too risky, too costly. So I'd rather go through life with both hands and lose one. Not the United States, man. We run these wars. People get wealthy, wildly, extravagantly wealthy. Raytheon's doing well. Lockheed Martin. Well, General Dynamics. Good God. Uh, you know, it's you know, money, 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 money. It's like cabaret. It seems that General Armageddon is back on mission. How? How? what's what's going on right now in Russia? Yeah, I've seen that report. And then I've seen other reports saying that the video showing him on the plane where he's reading or waving or something was an old video. So who knows? Doesn't matter. You know, if it's Suravikin or somebody else, Suravikin's, he doesn't have magical abilities. You know, he's he doesn't uh, leap tall buildings in a single bound. You know, he's not Superman. But, uh, you know, they're bringing him back. Okay. Uh, the offensive has started up around Kharkiv today. You know, they've been been doing the buildup, and now it looks like it's underway. They're moving moving on at least three, four fronts up there. And they've already, the Russians have already taken uh, three, at least three villages, maybe four. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's about 9 p.m. at night over there. It's starting to get dark. But uh, yeah. The uh, Russians are on the move, and now the Ukrainians got to figure out what the hell we're going to do up there. They've got to move forces there, but they're being attacked in uh, Avdivka, outside of Avdivka, and uh, Rovatino, and and you know, place after place after place after place. Chazifyar. It, it, it's like a sh you're on board a ship, and it's one thing if you just got one leak, you know, one hole to plug. Man. There are 20 holes to plug, and you you don't have enough fingers and toes to put in them all. We've learned that Germany is going to buy three HIMARS from the United States to send them to Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, just so amazing to know uh, that Germany has already told us that they have already transferred a quarter of the air defense system, of their air defense system to Ukraine. And they're trying to do the same, and they're they're continuing the same attitude that we have been witnessing during this conflict. Yeah, it makes makes you wonder if uh, we're going to sell them the Brooklyn Bridge too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got a deal. I tell you what, we're gonna we're offering you three, but you know what? If you take six, we'll throw in the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> with with this offensive underway and expanding. Uh, I, I think that, you know, there's a real potential for the Ukrainians to collapse and collapse very quickly. Um, you know, it's like that game of Jenga. You know, you got the tower with all the sticks in it and you're pulling one out and seeing how many you can pull out before the thing topples over. Uh, I don't know if we're a stick or two from them toppling, but we're close. Uh, you know, people get, well, yeah, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then in 2025, Sorry, that's like a terminal cancer patient with, uh, you know, you got brain cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer talking about, hey, what are we going to do for Christmas 2025? <laughs> well, I don't, I know what we're going to do, but you're not going to be around, okay? <laughs> that's, that's what's going on with Ukraine. You've just said that Ukraine is collapsing. Is there any type of understanding on the part of the Biden administration to analyze that? and see that Ukraine is collapsing right now. If they understand what's going on in Ukraine, why they're sending more weapons, more aid to Ukraine. We will learn that the Biden administration just announced that they're gonna send more weapons to Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And do you think the other point in this issue would be they know that Ukraine is collapsing, but they continue sending weapons because at the I don't end think of the they day, know. they don't have they don't want to take the blame to to, to no, put dude, the blame on them for dude, not helping Ukraine. I think you're being generous in your assumption. That I don't think they actually know that, or they don't want to know it. Uh, they're in denial. You know, the Kubler-Ross five stages of grief. 
First one's denial. That's they're still there. They're they're not admitting what's you know what many of us were predicting you know more than a year ago. And but still, some weren't weren't even seen six months ago. But now the growing number of at least journalists are starting to see it. Uh, this is, um, uh, you know, it, it's headed towards something bad. Yet they continue to insist, "Oh yeah, we got to let's pump pump more aid in." But it, you know, again, it's a shell game. It's a lie because the quote that it's not like they've got the the high Mars, the Patriots, the Attackums, the uh, new barrels for the Howitzers, the M triple sevens, uh, the Abrams, right? There's not like you got all this stacked up in a warehouse and going, boy, we need a clearance cell. We got, we got too much inventory. No, no, no. We don't have the inventory anymore. We've run it down, given it away. And now we're doing the beg, borrow and steal approach. Uh, hey, I'll, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. You know, we're go, we got our own troops training with South Korean 155 ammunition. Why? Because we don't have our own and we're not making enough of it fast enough to do it. So all this talk about, oh, yeah, we're going give, to give Ukraine some more aid. Go ahead, give them $2 trillion. And that $2 trillion, the only thing you can do with that $2 trillion is go out and try to buy yourself an army of trained people. Buy them, you know. And you find me the country that's stupid enough to want to take that money to go to Ukraine and get uh, eviscerated by the Russians, good luck with that. They found a few. <clears throat> Those guys keep getting killed. And some of them keep going home, going, oh, God, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, it's called war on a scale that we've not seen really since World War II. Uh, so th this promise of additional aid, you know, it's not going to change anything on the battlefield. And you would hope that the Biden administration, you know, I admire your optimism that they, they've grasped that they're in trouble and they're trying to figure a way out. But I don't see any signs of that. Um, this, uh, this month of May is going to be decisive. Just as it was decisive two years ago when Mariupol fell, that was the first big, big, victory for Russia became, you know, it came about a month and a half, almost two months after they realized they'd been betrayed again by the West. They thought they had agreed on a negotiated settlement with Ukraine, to keep Ukraine out of NATO, to protect the rights of the people in the Donbass, and Donetsk and Luhansk, and, uh, you know, to reach an accommodation with Ukraine. But that was sabotaged by the United States and by the Brits. So Russia then had to change its strategy. So now we're in a completely new phase where they're they're on they they're, they've really started their offensive. They started their offensive uh, shortly after the fall of Avdiivka, and uh, they just didn't announce it. You, you know, it's not like, hey, look at what we're gonna do. We're gonna go do X, Y, and Z, and you can't stop us. You know, they didn't they didn't opt for the you know the Babe Ruth. Uh, metaphor where you may Babe Ruth was a baseball player in the United States famous for hitting home runs and in one game he was famous for he pointed to center field with his bat and then hit the next one out so that's where you telegraph your move but the Russians haven't been telegraphing their moves they just move and then you got to sit there and pay attention to what's moving and when you go holy smokes they're they're moving all across the line they're they're advancing kilometers every day up and down a thousand mile line or six, uh, six, 700 mile line. I guess it's a thousand kilometer. So um, the United States has yet to come to, do, come to grips with that. So all, all this happy talk about, uh, oh, yeah, we're going to continue to provide aid. And, oh, we're going to put the, we're going to put together a 10 year plan to supply Ukraine with aid. Dude. They're not going to be here then. They're going to be gone. So go ahead and make your plans, but uh, they're for naught. There is a lot of change in this new administration of Putin. And 
do you think is that related to these new regions that are part of Russia right now? Because right now Russia is different. Before that, we didn't have this part, this eastern part of Ukraine. Right now, the eastern part of Ukraine is part of Russia. How is that going to be reflected in the Putin administration? Well, I, it's, I think they've already taken that into account. I mean, when you they added Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson uh, to uh, the Federal Republic, if if you will, the federal um, entity of Russia two years ago. So you know that's all that's already been in place for two years. So I, there's nothing. You know, it it it's sort of business as usual. I think so I don't think there's they're going to be doing anything new and dramatic. The one the one thing that's happening though is. Putin had insisted that they got to free Donetsk. They got to get all of Donetsk under Russian control and get the Ukrainians out so that they'll stop bombing uh, like the capital city in uh, Donetsk. Uh, so I think that's where the objective, that's where the focus is now. And then that's part of what we're seeing. Uh, once, you know, if, if, if these key places, if Chasif Yara falls and then there's a, a get the the name of the other city behind it to the west once that goes then, then the russians are the, the they got a wide open road road to the dnieper river and the ukrainians are going to face two choices fall back retreat abandon all territory uh, east of the dnieper or be trapped be killed or be captured how did you find this new trip of she to Europe. We know that France is so important right now between these two because they're trying to convince Chinese to not help Russia. And France is playing a big role in this type of a strategy on the part of the United States. At the same wow. time, he went to Serbia. How do you see these two trips? No, look, she, uh, she was reciprocating from the previous visit of Macron. And, you know, uh, Macron got slapped around a little bit in the meeting. I mean, you know, she made it clear. No, under no circumstances are we going to carry your water to the Russians, number one. Uh, we'll help bring about a peace settlement, but we'll do that in, in concert with the Russians. And the Russians are our friend, and that's not going to change. So if that's an issue, if that's a problem for you, then I guess we're going to have to part ways. That was the basic message. And so, you know, Macron coward that he is, you know, just, oh, no, 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 be, please be my friend. Okay. <laughs> so, and then she going to, he was sending a clear message, basically, because he, he was with the Hungarians and the Serbians who are both aligned with Russia. And they're, they're both at odds with the rest of Europe. And he was just telling the rest of the Europe, you know, screw off. We're going to, we will reward these countries that are uh, our friends and and are and friends of our friends. And, you know, I thought that was uh, he he made no no effort whatsoever to deal with the Brits or the Germans or anybody else. Sent a very clear message that uh, hey, in these countries, you know, it, it really it sort of it helps Orban and Hungary. And it, and it helps the Serbs as well. And they're about it because they're always being targeted by NATO. And, and he made a point of showing up there in Serbia on the day, the very day to commemorate uh, the anniversary of when NATO forces bombed the Chinese embassy and killed uh, several uh, uh, people there. I think a couple of, I'm not sure how many diplomats, but at least two journalists, Chinese journalists. So you know, sending a message to the West, we don't forget. The Chinese, unlike the West, the Chinese don't forget either. Long memory. Larry, how about Serbia joining BRICS? The first European country joining BRICS, that's going to yeah. be huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, why should they stay part of the Western club? The Western club keeps, frankly, you know, it's Excuse my language, but keep shitting on them every day. You know, would you be would you be friends with somebody who walked up and socked you in the face every time they saw you? <laughs> You'd avoid them. 
you try to get away from them. Get you know. That's what Serbia is doing. The the West is is a bully. It's it's just a abject bully. And uh, the, I think the Serbs have finally had enough. It's so funny to see how the West is trying so hard to put everything on the table to convince Chinese not to help Russia. Yeah, but it's 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 a lousy form of persuasion or salesmanship. I mean, you know, the, the West is doing the equivalent of walking up to the Chinese and kicking them in the crotch, and then saying, "Hey." Can you come help me? And then slapping them. Please come help me. Punching them. We're abusing the Chinese. Verbal abuse. Sanctions. Uh, verbal threats. From senior military person. Hey, uh, we're going to be at war with you in 2025. I, I, I am completely mystified by this U.S. approach. It is so stupid and counterproductive and destructive. Use whatever adjective you want. It's not designed to persuade the Chinese to do anything. It's designed to piss the Chinese off. And at least we're succeeding in that. Yeah, we're, we're angering the Chinese to the point that they don't care what we say. They care what we do. And they're going to be ready to counter that. You know, so you know, we have the audacity to approve more military aid to Taiwan, a country that we agreed with the Chinese years ago was part of China. Now we're giving a military aid to separate themselves from China. We wouldn't put up with that. You know, like, let's say Hawaii was in the status that Taiwan is. We claim you know, Hawaii is part of is ours. And the Chinese say, okay, well, it's yours. But then the Chinese say, oh, screw it. Let's, we're going to start arming the Hawaiian National Guard uh, with surface air missiles and things that could shoot down U.S. aircraft. Would we be okay with that? Hell no. So, but, but we can do it to the Chinese. God almighty. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, li we're like an incorrigible serial rapist. We're out raping everybody, and yet we're also wanting to hold the Rape, rape Prevention League. Okay? <laughs> Please don't rape women, and meanwhile, we're out doing it. It's just it's disgusting, and it's dangerous. It's the biggest flaw, because we keep thinking, oh, yeah, these Chinese, they're nothing. Militarily, they're nothing. We're, we're the biggest military in the world. Hey, good luck with that. Get your transgender swim team out trying to reach China. Because after they sink all of our aircraft carriers and battleships and destroyers and cruisers and whatever else is out there floating around, that's all we're going to have left. And you know that you know, I think that is probably the most likely scenario for the outbreak of World War III right now, that we will provoke a maritime, you know, provoke a confrontation with China. And look, the only way we can reach China is either we've got to send aircraft to drop bombs. Uh, that's, you know, that's never been an effective tool. And that would launch a nuclear strike by China on us. Uh, hit them with our, our, you know, nuclear submarines. Again, you run the risk of a nuclear war. Or if you couch it as, okay, we're going to do a defensive mission of Taiwan. Uh, and we're going to send a two or three carrier task force out there. All right, at that point, Chinese can hit those and overwhelm them easily. We 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 haven't even really fully war gamed what that would be like. And when when all of a sudden the United States loses there, its ability, its its whole uh, status as a superpower is going to be called into question. It will have been decisively defeated. I think that's on the horizon. After two years of this war, this conflict in Ukraine, there is a British think tank that published an article that says that we got it wrong all along this war. This war in Ukraine is war of attrition, is not yeah. war of maneuver. 
they're not embarrassed with what they're saying right now? Yeah, After well, hey, years? well, well, you know, I was saying this two years ago. Andre Martianov was writing about it seven years ago. That's part of the reason I could say it two years ago because I read Andre's book. This was exactly what he, in losing military supremacy, that's where he laid out this whole foundation of what the problems were for confronting the West, how it had actually lost military supremacy. And, you, you know, we're still dealing with these people that say that, oh, Russia's running out of missiles, Russia's running out of tanks, Russia's army is third rate, Russia's got conscripts of uh, who are prisoners, right? you know, bad, you know, Russia can't do anything right. Even, oh, they're, they're scavenging computer chips out of washing machines and refrigerators in order to field missiles. It's all a lie. It's all self-delusion. That, oh, Russia's losing because they did. It, it, we always view, the West always views wars like this in terms of uh, the Hollywood movies about World War II. D-Day, you know, General Patton swinging through France, covering all this territory. That's how wars are fought. No, you know, the Russians are, the Russians said from the outset that they were going to uh, conduct a war of attrition. They didn't say it specifically that way, but they said they were going to demilitarize Ukraine. Well, that's called attrition. And uh, at no point, you know, when, when we saw them fall back across, uh, when General Surabikin ordered the forces that were in Kherson in October of 2022 to fall back from the east side or the west side of the Dnieper River to the east side. Well, he did that because he recognized they weren't in a situation where they had enough troops on the ground that they were going to fight a savage battle like Stalingrad to hang on and not give an inch of territory. They could have done that. They could have stayed on uh, the west bank of the of uh, in Kherson and fought a new 21st century version of Stalingrad, which would have been extremely bloody, extremely costly. But then you got to worry about resupplies across the river and you know everything else. No, it pulled them back across. All oh, the west side. See, the Ukrainians are so powerful. The Russians are so weak. This is no, 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 no. It was, it, it was, it was a proper. A strategic move in terms of where the Russian war plan was at the time. Well, now, you know, now we're seeing, it's like if you keep investing, you know, $5 a week from your paycheck, $5 a week. And that's, yeah, that's not a lot of money and you're not going to get wealthy that way, but you keep putting it in the bank and it keeps drawing, you know, maybe 10% interest. And all of a sudden, 50 years later, you got a good pile of money just by putting away that little bit each week. Well, that's what the Russians were doing. They weren't moving in these big, big movements to have massive numbers of troops. You know, it wasn't like the Victory in Europe parade yesterday where everybody's marching through, you know, thousands of soldiers in one unit. No, uh, they, 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 had a, they had a different plan in place and they followed that plan and they're winning. So yeah, the the article by Alex Vershin in, in uh, the Royal... Uh, uh, what is it, Royal uh, uh, University Studies Institute or, uh, you know, RUSI. Uh, yeah, great article. But, you know, he's seven years late. Andre Matiana wrote about it first.